let us begin with just a prayer. Loving and compassionate God, we stand before you in silence, beseeching your help. Enfold us in your love tonight. Give us your wisdom. Help us to find you through the wisdom you have given all of your children. God be with us. Amen. Amen. Well, officially, welcome to Aquinas Institute, to our We Have a Prayer, Interfaith Relations in Difficult Times. This session was inspired by the difficult times that come through the wars raging in our world, wars that fuel hatred between countries and often spill over to hatred between religious beliefs. And yet, most of us know here that it is only through God's help that we can overcome hatred, that we can build a better world. And so we need to come together somehow in understanding, in bridge building, um, and coming together perhaps together to pray, to ask God to guide us into making a better world. That's the spirit of which we did it. We launched this event tonight. It's co-sponsored by four institutions. Aquinas Institute of Theology, Eden Theological Seminary, the Islamic Foundation of Greater St. Louis, and the St. Louis Jewish Community Relations Council. And we brought these groups together because they represent three Abrahamic faiths that share so much in common that really, in some ways, we are all praying to the one God and looking to that one God to help us. So these are the issues that we will explore tonight. And uh, we got three prominent speakers who I'll let somebody else introduce, but uh, Rabbi Steve Gutau, Dr. Michael Kinneman, and Dr. Saeed Saeed. So I think we're gonna go in the order of our founding for our speaking. <laughs> and our, our process tonight will be a short introduction of each of the speakers. Uh, the speakers will go for about 20 minutes a piece. Then we'll have a short five minute kibitz with your neighbor about that. And we'll do that two more times. And then we should have about 45 minutes at the end for questions and answer, which I hope the speeches certainly and the kibitzing will help bring out questions that we want to ask. And you didn't tell people who you are. <laughs> and I didn't. And I am, <laughs> thank you. I am Father Scott Stein Kirshner, um, visiting professor of interreligious theology here at Aquinas Institute. Uh, now doing that adjunct catch as catch can. And uh, a lot of this tonight was funded by the Henry Luce Foundation, who gave Aquinas a grant to explore interreligious dialogue more in the context of educating Christian ministers. Thank you. Um, so, Batya Abram Abramson Goldstein. <laughs> Somebody with Steinkirch? Yes, I know. That's the worst part. And my neighbors were Goldsteins when I was growing up. So what can I say? Batya, please, if you would introduce Rabbi Steve Gutow. Thank you, Scott. And uh, uh, I am Batya Abramson Goldstein. I'm executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council. And it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Rabbi Steve Gutow. Before I do that, I'm going to take a minute, Scott, to thank you, to thank Father Stein Kirshner. Thank 
whose presence has enriched St. Louis, and we are so happy that you are going to remain here. Thank you, and thank you to Aquinas. Uh, Rabbi Steve Guto is president of the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, the Public Policy and Community Relations Coordinating Agency of the American Jewish Community. In this position, Rabbi Guto has mobilized the Jewish community and advocated that the government end the genocide in Darfur, reform immigration policy, support Israel, protect individual rights, maintain and enhance anti-poverty programs, and create a sustainable environment. He's one of the good guys. <laughs> Rabbi Guto has also worked diligently to foster a stronger bond among the Christian, Jewish, and Muslim faiths. For his leadership, Rabbi Guto has been named among the 20 most influential American rabbis by Newsweek in 2009 and the 50 most influential American Jews by the Jewish Forward in 2007. With Rabbi Guto at the helm, the JCPA has become a central agency in combating hunger in America. In 2008, he challenged Jewish and non-Jewish leaders to join him in a food stamp challenge, committing to eat almost as only as much food in a week as could be purchased with $21, the average food stamp benefit. He has helped lead environmental campaigns, including a light onto the nations, which called on Jewish individuals and organizations to conserve energy. His commitment to building interfaith bridges has helped create important milestones, such as the joint prayer that is our focus this evening. Steve Guto is at heart a community organizer and has helped build grassroots coalition literally across the nation on a broad range of issues. Rabbi Guto is both an attorney and rabbi. He practiced law in his native Texas, where he also served as chair of the Dallas Jewish Community Relations Council. Uh, he went on to become the founding executive director of the National Jewish Democratic Council. He was ordained by the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in 2003. And this is the St. Louis link. He served as a pulpit rabbi at the Reconstructionist Minion of St. Louis, where he also represented the St. Louis Rabbinical Association on the Jewish Community Relations Council. At the same time, he served as adjunct professor of law at St. Louis University Law School, teaching a seminar on Jewish law. In workshops, speeches, and articles, he has addressed subjects including racial harmony, religious pluralism, and civil liberties, the safety and security of Israel, poverty, and health care. Uh, his article, Tikkun Olam, A Public Policy Focus, expressed his understanding of the underpinnings of the Jewish rationale for social justice, something incredibly central to Rabbi Guto's being. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Rabbi Steve Guto. Bacha, well, I guess after that, I would just sit down because it's going to, ain't no way it's not going to go down from here. In fact, I may just sit down. So. So anyway, thank you. I want to thank um, the Aquinas Institute of Theology and thank you, Scott. You've done remarkable work uh, over the months that we've been pl playing around setting this up. Thank you. I want to thank Eden Seminary. I want to thank the Islamic Foundation of Greater St. Louis and of course, the St. Louis Jewish Community Relations Council. 
Um, and I guess, I didn't know that until I walked in here, Henry Luce. I never thought I'd be thanking Henry Luce, but thank you <laughs> wherever you are, Henry Luce. Um, and of course, my you know feelings about Batya and David. Where's David? Over there. And Gazala, who I've just met, who I know have had a lot to do. Oh, there you are, not, not in that room. Um, anyway, thank you. Uh, Bacha just described a little bit about JCPA, but what we are is an umbrella group that represents 125 Jewish Community Relations Councils, like the one you have here. Of course, the one you have here is spectacular, but some of the others are good or <laughs> also. And also 14 national Jewish organizations, including um, the ADL and the American Jewish Committee, and I'll, I'll skip some because I'll just forget them, but National Council of Jewish Women and Hadassah, and um, the four major streams, uh, the reform movement, etc. In fact, today we had a very important moment in that our chair, who is from Dallas, actually, which is where I'm from, she was one of the small number of people who met with uh, President Obama. There was about 15 Jewish leaders in the, uh, in the White House, and I'm really pleased that Andrea was one of them. And I wouldn't feel too comfortable starting without telling you a little bit about my experiences here. Yeah, I was a rabbi for the Reconstructionist Synagogue, um, and I know it's new rabbis in this room. I also worked for with All God's People, which was a an effort to really br bring out public policy uh, fr through the re religious voice. And I worked with Michael Kinnaman and Dr. Rana, who is, I know I've seen him here, I know he's, Dr. Rana, where are you? There he is, the wonderful man that he is. Um, I had uh, great experiences just g driving around on my little bike, which I loved, uh, Forest Park or the Central West End or, your city is a, just an amazing town, and I, I have great, great memories. I also, and then I'll stop this in there, I just want to say that there has become a very, very special relationship that's developed between Michael and Saeed and myself. And I want to publicly thank you for being the kind of people you are to allow this really beautiful experience to happen. So what were we thinking when we wrote that prayer. I assume you all have looked at it. We were forlorn about the situation in Gaza. We had different narratives, we knew that. We had different ideas of who was right and who was wrong. And that wasn't actually gonna change. And we knew, since we couldn't get beyond that, that we needed to go somewhere higher for an answer, or whatever, deeper. Um, and we also knew we couldn't just talk about Gaza because there are and there were so many places of horror in the world, some known and some were unknown because God knows where things bad are happening. So it wasn't all, all that complicated. I mean, people, how did it happen? We called each other on the telephone. Michael, who's really good with prayers, wrote a draft. And uh, we all just felt, we, you know, we talked about it a little bit, mostly it was just a good draft. And we all felt it was time to reach up and reach out and tell all our people that we felt something had to happen for above, from above, and it had, it had great resonance. I mean, I speak in a lot of synagogues and churches and uh, not too many mosques, maybe you'll, we can remedy that. And um, <laughs> people often, you know, I was just shocked. They would take out this prayer. They must have got it off the internet or something. But people knew about this prayer that we'd written, and I was just like, wow, and they'd read it. And, you know, we talked deeply. We talked about Afghanistan and Darfur and Burma and the Congo and Sri Lanka and the Middle East, and we talked about the need to seek peace and the need to do it in our own vo voice. And I, I'm taking no credit, but because um, the situation in Gaza is still bad, but the war's over, so it had some, maybe it had some good, some good. The most important thing to know, and we all know that, we for sure, prayer is not enough. Uh, we knew that, but still we decided to start there. There are two Jewish principles, which I believe probably apply to both to all the religions in this room, and certainly to the two, your two religions. One is, we were all made precious in God's image, but Selim Elohim, in the image of God in Hebrew. We're immensely valuable. We all have great dignity. Each human being does, and that was principle one. In principle two, and we're all called by our covenant, by our deal with God, our agreement with God. Uh, to take a role, to, 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 to work with what God teaches us, but to stop oppression and evil 
and poverty and hunger and sickness in this world. So in other words, we all have work to do. None of the three of us were ever assuming that prayer is an end in itself, but rather it's a place of deep connection from which we can begin to find good endings because we open ourselves up into all that love. Um, there's a story about, about, about how God does prayer and God takes prayer. You know, there, and, and I'm sure you've heard it, but you know, when you come to a speech, you get to hear it again. Uh, there, there was a flood in some town. And this family gets up on the, the roof because they're very God-fearing. And they get up and they start saying, God, save us. Save us, God. And, um, you know, they're looking up. A boat comes by and says, come on, get in, get in. We'll, we're going to take you to, we're waiting for God. And then another boat comes by. Same deal. No, no, we're waiting for God. And the third boat comes, we're waiting. And so finally, uh, they die in the flood. And they get up to heaven. They're just angry. And they go up there and they see the, they see the, people that run heaven and they go, what, what happened? You know, we believe in God. What, what happened? And, and God shows up and God says, well, you know what? I came by three times through those boats to save you and you refused to get in. <laughs> so God expects us to, to respond. There's a poem by Jack Reamer. He's a rabbi in America. And he says, we can't merely pray for good endings. We must pray that we can find the way to create good endings. And, and his poem says this, and I'm going to take you through just a few of the verses, not all of it. We can't merely pray to God to end war, for the world was made in such a way that we must find our own path of peace within ourselves and with our neighbor. We cannot merely pray to God to root out prejudice, for we already have eyes with which to see the good in all people if we'd only use them rightly. We cannot merely pray to God to end starvation, for we already have the resources with which to feed the entire world if we would only use them wisely. And then I'll, I won't read the other verses, but it ends like this. Therefore, we pray instead for strength, determination, and willpower to do instead of merely to pray, to become instead of merely to wish that our world may be safe and that our lives may be blessed. Taking that charge seriously gives us an opportunity to move forward. That prayer we, we wrote was only a beginning, a way to see the world through eyes far deeper, far richer, and far more loving than human eyes, and to join ourselves to those eyes there, not only when we are in times of great difficulty, challenges, and disagreement did we, do we pray, but even more so when we are in times of agreement, in times of, 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 of justice together. We may, well dis dis we may well disagree with policies of the Middle East, with abortion, or, and we do, some in this room, gay rights, prayer in school. I don't know, and the three of us haven't really talked about all that. Uh, we haven't even spoken about it. But even then, we bring God into the discussion, not as the decider, not as this is the way it is, but as the source of our own great love for humanity. We bring something into the equation so beautiful to us that we tend to see each other, all of us can, in a more spiritual way. And it's very necessary in these difficult times. It's in that willingness to open up and talk in the heat of controversy that creates the friendships that allow us to work together in times of agreement. And the three of us have certainly done so. Since that prayer, we three wrote an op-ed against hate crimes, it was published in the Washington Post, appeared together among a group of religious leaders at a press conference on health care just, just a few days ago in Washington. We, we, we were three of the people that spoke. Uh, and, on, and, and on our support of a commission of inquiry to investigate culture where we're really taking on the present administration who doesn't seem to want to do it. We almost don't feel whole when we're not together. We kind of like to look out and see each other. It makes us feel good. We even have... To, we even have significant plans this fall and in the future to work on the issues of poverty together. What, what a wonderful coalition we three have forged. We started the ball rolling, our unified belief that the three of us find the presence of God or God's kindness or chesed is what the word is in Hebrew, loving kindness in the political world. In believing that we're given a joint understanding that we have a common center called God, even if we don't always follow the same path. There's always a question raised, why not, of the integrity of praying together. I'm sure a lot of you have said, how can you 
pray an interfaith prayer. How could a Christian pray in the same service as a Muslim or, or a Jew and a Muslim or a Christian and a Jew? I don't want to leave out anybody. Prayer in Judaism is the act of standing before God and communicating in one way or another and it's done best as part of a community. So what an interfaith community, when we can do it, when we wish to pray together and the words are respectful, I am willing to join. Many would say that interfaith prayer is not right and destroys the whole efficacy of the prayer and I really do respect their right to their viewpoint. But for those of us who are able to pray together, not always, but on occasion, we can do it. We need to understand our purpose for doing so, respect our differences, and if we choose to pray out loud, be respectful of those in our own religious communities who find such prayer problematic. When I was a rabbinic student, I talked about this a few minutes ago, we had small discussions, uh, and I was, I just aged rapidly. I, was, I only graduated in 2003. Um, I don't know how it happened. I was just a kid in 2003. I was in a group sponsored by the National Conference of Community and Justice. The group was called Seminarians Interacting, and it was made up of Muslims and Jews and Christians, and nobody's as intense. I know there's a few in this room. It's people studying to be a priest or an <laughs> imam or a rabbi. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's tough stuff. And I recall the deep conversations, because we had sometimes split off, among the Jewish students there about how to accept or be a part of these services. There were answers from, I'm a spectator, to I feel God's presence in any service, whether or not the words used are my w words. Uh, you can imagine probably where I was on that continuum. I imagine these conversations were being replayed among Christians and Muslims. Uh, a month ago, I was in, uh, in May actually, I guess it was a little more than a month ago, I was in Israel and I went with a group, an interfaith group of Muslims, Christians and Jews to visit the leaders of the Council of Religious Leaders in the Holy Land. Um, and it was really, it was, it's quite a group. It's the chief rabbis and the head of the Sharia law court and the head of all the Christian organizations. And they meet together. It's not easy because these people don't have an easy time talking to each other. I, I could see that. But what interested me was back in 2007, and the group's been going on for about six years, uh, the JCPA hosted a meeting for them. They wanted to meet Jewish leaders. Uh, so we hosted a meeting in Washington, and it was right before Annapolis. Do you all know Annapolis was when the peace talks were going on? And there was a man in the back, and I'm, I'm almost sure, uh, Michael, he was Christian, but I'm, I'm not sure, because he was, you know, it's a, it a lot of people. And he said, don't you think that they should take us, he was from Jerusalem, they should take us seriously? I mean, I don't think he said that we should be the ones that make the decisions. You know, we're not, we're not the, the government people that get to do that, but we should be heard, and we're not being heard, and the, the work we've done together should be heard. And, and, and so he said all this, and it was pretty interesting stuff. And then a guy whose name will clearly be unmentioned, a very conservative guy, a guy who I worried would say, a Jewish guy, something antagonistic to everything, raised his hand, and I really had no choice. It was against my better instincts, but I had no choice but to call on him and breathe deeply, hoping. <laughs> and this guy looks at that guy, the, the Christian guy, and he says, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to this off. I'm going to tell you something. He said, if you think that those government leaders, Bush and kind of whoever was there, you know, whoever was in that room, uh, I guess it was Abbas and um, Omer, if you think they have the power of, of, of this group, if you all ever put your heart and soul into having peace in the Middle East, you're crazy. And it was this powerful moment where I realized that the very power of, of religion coming together and saying, we're not going to put up with this, it could be a lot. Recently, in late June, I was at a colloquium of evangelical Christian and Jewish leaders. The JCPA had been the main organizer. When it came time to open the discussion, I was tasked with giving the invocation. Not so easy to do in that room. It's a little nervous. <laughs> there were many different evangelicals as well as rabbis who were from all the Jewish movements and three or four that were orthodox and I was nervous. One of the ministers was Reverend Joel Hunter. I don't know if you all remember him, but he was this rather wonderful guy who gave the benediction at the Democratic National Convention last summer. He ended his prayer there by saying that everyone should close by speaking to God in their own special way. So I closed, invoking Joel's ending in Joel's name, and I believe everybody felt good with that kind of an ending for prayers. I think that was really whole and rich. Is there a limit 
to how we can use religion in determining public policy? Of course there is. God doesn't weigh in on specific policies because God is way beyond our understanding. But when most of us look at our traditions, we know that helping everyone to be healthy and educated and whole human beings are what our texts teach us. There's a Hebrew word, shleimut, comes from shalom or, the, or vice versa, and it means wholeness or completeness. It describes the condition I think we're all hoping for. We know that all of our traditions prefer peace to war. All of, us, all, of the, all of them ask us to be kind to the stranger. All of us ask us to worry about the, the condition of the earth. <clears throat> Excuse me. All ask us to pay special attention to the poor. And although I would never say that Judaism insists on this policy or that policy, I'm comfortable in speaking of its basic directions and its basic hopes for a different world, a better world. I believe that when we bring God into the room, not to tell us how to act, because as I said, None of our religions, none of us, none of our traditions are so wise as to be able to discern any exact messages from God. Still, when we do call on God in prayer as we understand God, we often find pathways that bring us together. When we do that, we develop not only an understanding of a common belief in something greater than ourselves, but we become closer, we become friends. Many years ago, I read a book about friendship by Martin Marty, a theologian, a very famous one, at the University of Chicago, and an ordained evangelical Lutheran minister. Anybody evangelical Lutheran or Lutheran in this room? <laughs> oh, I am good. I'm glad. I just wanted there to be somebody. But he was our professor. And, and he was Michael's professor, so, okay, I'm, I'm moved. Mar Marty asserted, and I agree, that in the embracement of friendship, there is a closeness, there is a trust to oppose tyrants, and because you can't tell a friend no, to move forward in acts of goodness in the world. If interfaith prayer and work for justice can do that, then we should engage much, as much and as deeply and as often as we possibly can. I'll close. I know Saeed, Michael, and myself, we're, we're destined to continue to find ways through prayer or through actions or through our common understanding of the past God so wishes for us to do everything we can to repair this broken world. That's called tikkun olam in Hebrew. We will not look at sorrow and pain, at human suffering, at genocides and people hurting because we don't have decent health, they don't have decent health care. We won't watch immigrants, strangers in America, treated differently than the mandates of our sacred texts and not do everything we possibly can to seek God's counsel and God's concern about God's people. If we believe that we can find an answer through prayer, we will do that in a way that meets the concerns of most. And after our prayers, we will do every single thing we can to alleviate the tragic injustices that dot the landscapes of our world. That much I know. So shalom aleichem, salam aleichem, and may peace be upon all of you and all of us. Thank you. And now take two minutes of chaos talking to your neighbor next to you. What did you hear? What would you like to ask when we get to the question section? Welcome back. Uh, there is in the Christian tradition a thing called passing the peace, and once you start, no one ever stops. It's really, so uh, we're glad to have you back. My name is David Greenhaw. I'm the president of Eden Theological Seminary, and it is my uh, privilege and pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Michael Kinneman uh, this evening. Uh, Michael Kinneman, for many of you, doesn't need much of an introduction, because although he was only in St. Louis for eight years, he turned St. Louis upside down and on its ear. He was a whirlwind of activity in our community and immediately began interfaith conversations, speaking and addressing many people and bringing folks together. Dr. Kenneman is uh, now the head of the National Council, General Secretary of the National Council of Churches uh, in New York City. Uh, a, an organization that represents a whole incredible broad diversity of Christian communities and uh, and is uh, and is incredibly helpful in that group. We we were fortunate, Michael and I, to, to run into each other just about two weeks ago, and I heard stories about the work he's doing. And he's having people who have a hard time getting together, finding ways to get together. That's Michael Kinneman's vocation. He does not allow us to talk to each other without speaking the truth to each other. He's willing to say hard words and come right back. 
and let you say hard words as well. This is hard when he says it to you. We were colleagues. It was hard. <laughs> but it was also fair, always fair, always having the best interests of the other in mind. Dr. Michael Kinneman is an incredible leader in this country. We're blessed, all of us, to have his leadership and his strong voice. And I know many of you in this room say with me how fortunate I am, how fortunate we are, to have Michael as a friend. Michael, welcome. Thank you. Well, I get to do one of my favorite things in the world, which is to speak on behalf of all Christians. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> it's great to be back in St. Louis. Great to be back in St. Louis with so many friends in this room in the midst of this tremendously vibrant interfaith community. What a joy it is to be here. And I want to say thanks not only for uh, the sponsoring bodies, but of course to Aquinas for hosting us here. They have been wonderful hosts, except when I asked them for baseball tickets for the All-Star Game. <laughs> Scott drew the line and um, I don't know, hosting stopped right at that point. It also is wonderful to be here with these very special friends, with Steve and Saeed. I just can't uh, share with you the joy it has been to work with them. I also was going to share what Steve did, which is to say that Gaza, Middle East, is by no means the only thing that we work on together. And as he mentioned, within just the last month, we have protested at the White House together on behalf of a commission of inquiry to deal with the torture perpetrated by this country in recent years and to say that the truth must come out about it so that it never ever happens again. And just last Tuesday, we were at the White House, or the Capitol building rather, meeting with congressional leadership in order to speak about the great need for universal health care in this country, in order that you know of it. How do we say it strongly enough? Uh, uh, all the issues that we deal with, like climate change, are simply too big to be dealt with alone. The Jewish response to war doesn't make any sense any more than the Christian response to, the, to climate change. These are issues that are too great. They demand, God demands, I would think, that we respond to them together. To give you an indication of how closely we work, someone suggested to me when we were at the Capitol last Tuesday, this is true, that the three of us should start a lobbying firm. <laughs> <laughs> Saeed, Guto, and Kinnaman. <laughs> Has a ring to it, anything? So, um, I don't know, that's all right. But in fact, friends, and I hope you agree with this, we don't lobby because lobbyists act on behalf of those with resources. We advocate, which is to say we stand for those who don't have resources and who don't have lobbyists to work for them, and we think that's exactly the role of religion, and we hope that you agree. Okay. I would like to start my comments by asking you to envision a continuum which helps to frame the remarks that I want to make this evening. This is actually one that I tried out at the luncheon with the Jewish Community Relations Council and the Jewish Federation as I was leaving town uh, two years ago. But uh, you may find it useful, and let me try it. So you might even want to write it down on your paper. Imagine a continuum of different moments in the relationship of different communities, interfaith communities, with one another. At one end of this continuum, you might imagine the relationship of competition. <laughs> I'll come back to this in a moment. Somewhere down the continuum, you have the relationship of coexistence. 
On down the continuum, you have the relationship of cooperation. Isn't it neat? You can get them all in C's here. And then somewhere else down that continuum, you have the relationship of commitment. Competition, coexistence, cooperation, and commitment. Now, I don't mean to imply that interfaith relations always go through a linear progression. That would be a mistake. There are persons, as you well know, within our faith communities who fall at all of those points on this continuum right here in St. Louis right now. But there can be growth, I think, from one stage to another, and a few generalizations might be useful. For centuries, interfaith relations in the West have been primarily a matter of, what, competition with Christians as the dominant group bearing most of the responsibility for this painful state of affairs. Now, of course, in other parts of the world, religious communities, as Dr. Saeed certainly knows well from his own native India, have coexisted for a long time. And this began to happen in the West, in this country, at least in some of our communities, by the middle of the last century. Standing here in Aquinas, it's very important for us all to acknowledge that the breakthrough was the Second Vatican Council with Nostra Aetate, with its declaration on the non-Christian religions, which spoke about a relationship not of competition, but beyond that, perhaps even to cooperation, but certainly to coexistence. Over the past two generations then, that's why I used to tell students at Eden how privileged you are to go into ministry now. Because over the past two generations, some Christians, some Jews, and some Muslims, especially the first two, have moved to the level of cooperation with one another, often with the disapproval of their co-religionists. This, of course, is the great irony of the situation, that the closer we draw to one another, the more splits or divisions there often are within our own religious communities. It's clear, however, that cooperation can be disrupted by outside events. Are you with me? 9-11 disrupted some patterns of cooperation we had moved to that over the last two generations. But 9-11 disrupted some of those patterns of cooperation, especially between, I'll speak now of Christians and Muslims, just as the Palestinian-Israeli conflict has disrupted patterns of cooperation between Jews and Christians within recent years. How does the commitment stage differ from cooperation? Let me name three ways. First of all, if you're at the level of commitment and not simply cooperation, then we have gone beyond trading information, getting to know you, to a willingness to learn from one another in ways that enhance our own faith. Am I making sense? It's one thing to say, we're going to tell you about our faith and to receive from you information about yours. It's another to say, we might learn something about the nature of God and God's purposes by our encounter with you. I have taught here at Eden Seminary with Rabbi Susan Talvey, a Jewish Christian dialogue course during the years that I was a professor at Eden. And during that time, we came to find that we learned from one another in very profound ways. Uh, she would speak about um, uh, the deeds that humans do drawing God into the world, which felt to me like works righteousness, human-centered. And I had to realize that part of my faith was also the response of humans to God's initiative, otherwise I hadn't spoken the whole of it. Am I make, I mean, do you see what I'm talking about? We can learn from the other at that stage of commitment. A second thing is that at the commitment stage, we go beyond periodic cooperation to a sustained recognition that mission demands the other. If we were serious at the National Council of Churches about this, for example, we wouldn't simply invite Dr. Saeed and Rabbi Guto to come as observers to our assemblies. We would insist that they be there because our mission as a National Council would be incomplete without the work of their bodies. Third, however, if we were at the stage of commitment, 
then we would be able to stay together even in the face of great disagreement. In other words, there's a real difference on this continuum, I think, between being at the stage of cooperation where we act together and being at a deeper stage of commitment where indeed we're marked by these characteristics. I would say that Steve, Saeed, and I have reached a level of commitment beyond cooperation even though, I'll see if they nod, our organizations aren't always there. <laughs> Let me offer now four principles or characteristics which I think are associated with interfaith commitment. So if we're to move from cooperation to commitment, these are four broad principles or characteristics which I think characterize it. First of all, there is simply no substitute for knowing one another as friends. Commitment is based on and expressed through friendship. Our National Council policy statement on interfaith relations says that all relationship begins with meeting, with getting to know one another as persons of faith. Of course, the people in our religious communities do know each other in other settings, in work or in school, but there is an essential role for groups like interfaith partnership in enabling people to know each other as believers and thus to grow as friends from different religious communities. Um, your dialogue groups through interfaith partnership are a wonderful way for that to happen. Last night we were talking with David and Joy Sternick about the group that includes Howard, I think is part of that, and the Willicks, Barbara and uh, Mike. They are committed through friendship in a way that I suspect, see if Howard nods, would hold up in difficult circumstances. No question. No question. Now, of course, familiarity, while it usually doesn't breed contempt, doesn't always lead to friendship. That may be my understatement of the evening, but you get the point. <laughs> But in our case it has, and that has enabled us to stay together and to pray together even though we didn't see eye to eye with regard to Gaza. Steve, I think, thought that the incursion was justifiable in light of rocket attacks on Israeli settlements. I found it to be an overreaction. You hear the problem that we had in trying to deal with it. Let me add, there is an obvious distinction between interfaith relations and interfaith dialogue. Interfaith dialogue is sustained conversation aimed at sharing our faith-based perspectives as a, on a common topic in order to arrive at a deeper understanding. By interfaith relations, I take it, we mean various forms of life together, including this kind of shared activity for justice, through which persons of faith and their communities gain deeper appreciation for one another. Now this is where it gets interesting because interfaith dialogue can provide a foundation for better interfaith relations. But solid interfaith relations can also help dialogues persevere even when the going gets tough. The JCPA, Jewish Council on Public Affairs, and the National Council of Churches are the main sponsoring bodies for a Jewish Christian dialogue table that has wouldn't you say, practically ground to a halt over disagreements regarding Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Practically for sure. Practically for sure. Not long ago, Steve called me at home, and he said, I'm quoting, your boys are acting badly again. <laughs> It's the exact language. What had happened is that one of the Christian dialogue participants had sent a letter that could be read as questioning the integrity of one of Steve's colleagues. And Steve was prepared to respond with a fairly sharply worded letter of his own, which he read to me so that I could talk him out of it, which I did. <laughs> You see the point. There is no substitute for genuine friendship. And I would say right now, it is simply our friendship which is holding together this dialogue table. <laughs> Number two, commitment grows by being present when the other requests it or has need. In 2002, at the height of the violence during the Second Intifada, I was asked to speak at a Stand with Israel rally here in St. Louis, which I did 
despite some discouragement from Christian colleagues. The time when friends stand with friends, I said to the rally, is not simply when it's easy to do so, but precisely when it isn't. Susan Talvey, Bach Abramson Goldstein, and others often cited my presence at this rally, where, as she will testify, I spoke strongly about Palestinian rights as a basis for our ongoing collaboration as colleagues here in the city. In the same way, I think it mattered to Dr. Saeed that I provided letters in support of ISNA when charges, spurious charges, were brought against it regarding its potential association with various groups regarded as terrorists. I think it mattered to Steve that I joined Jewish friends in public protest of President Ahmadinejad in his hateful rhetoric against Jews in Israel. And I know it mattered greatly to me that Steve has accompanied me on visits twice to the Israeli ambassador protesting policies of the Israeli government that negatively affect Palestinians in Jerusalem and especially Palestinian Christians. Part of being friends is always taking seriously what the friend takes seriously. Steve took the Christian situation in Jerusalem and the West Bank so seriously that as an observant Jew, he twice returned on trains to New York on a Friday evening because it was more important for him to stand with me. What do you think I'll do when the next situation arises? Boy, this makes a difference. Number three, closely related. Commitment grows when we are sensitive, as sensitive as possible, to the fears and pressures that weigh on the other partners. It isn't possible for me to fully comprehend what it feels like to be a Muslim in this country at this historical moment. But that, of course, is no excuse for not trying. If, God forbid, there is another attack on the United States and it is associated with Muslims, our staff at the National Council of Churches is already prepared to mobilize the churches to act and speak in support of Muslim neighbors, and I have no doubt in my mind that Steve and the JCPA will do the same. In the same way, disregard for Israel's welfare would be incompatible with any genuine concern for the Jewish community. I hope that Christians will speak out on behalf of Palestinian rights and on behalf of a viable independent Palestinian state. And this may well mean criticism of some policies and actions of the Israeli government. But if we would be at the level of commitment, then such criticism must be set within an affirmation of Israel's right to exist in peace and security. Prior to the fighting in Gaza, I should have spoken out I should have spoken out about the missile attacks on Israeli towns, and the fact that I didn't undermined my moral authority once Gaza began. By the way, one of the things we need to be sensitive to is the fact that our partners here at hand have co-religionists to whom they are related and to whom they must listen in other places. <laughs> I have had Jews ask me why Christians are so exercised on behalf of Palestinians when you don't have a dog in that fight. But as you're all aware, that's not true. Just as American Jews are attentive to Jews in Tel Aviv, and American Muslims are attentive to Muslims in Damascus, so American Christians are attentive to Christians in Ramallah. Friends, take this into account. And fourth, commitment to one another, even in difficult times, demands acting and speaking with integrity. It would never do for me to say one thing to Steve and another to Saeed. We need to trust that the other is consistent, which can be a value of gatherings such as this one, because we have to say it with them sitting right there. <laughs> do I have two minutes left, Scott? I want to say a final word about prayer.
No one wishes for difficult times or for moments of disagreement, and it isn't possible, it isn't appropriate to speak about silver linings when people are being hurt. Amen, I hope you feel. But at such times, since we can't revel in what we accomplish, we can be driven back to the heart of our faith traditions. It might just be that in such moments we come once again to the foot of our God. Prayer, as I see it from my Christian perspective, focuses on God and thus moves us beyond ourselves, our grievances, our disputes, relativizes our positions by reminding us that God alone is sovereign, reinforces our interdependence as children of one creator, and engenders hope that our tensions are by no means the final word on reality, that we live toward God's future. Very important to remember that the ecumenical movement, a Christian ecumenical movement, uh, has always said prayer is at the very heart of our effort to come together as Christians. That has been the message especially of the Roman Catholic Church from Vatican II down to the present. It is the message of many Catholic neighbors here in St. Louis. Jim and Kathy McGinnis, for example, of the wonderful Institute for Peace and Justice have just printed a new book on praying for peace. No bigger activists grounded always in prayer, and that of course has been the teaching message as well of Sister Carla Mae Streeter here at Aquinas. The image which is often used in ecumenical documents is a simple one. Since God is at the center, the closer we draw to God, or better, the closer we are drawn to God, the closer we come to one another. Two final points that bear on our discussion. First, if we are to pray for and with one another, we need to know one another far better than we generally do. We should pray for and with one another regularly and in our totality, not just in moments of crisis, lest we be driven by the headlines in terms of how we pray. Clearly, we're not there yet. Second, prayer for and with the other is not, as Steve said, a substitute for practical acts of solidarity and common service. Rather, I think of prayer for the other, while addressed to God, also as a mobilization of our imagination and our will on behalf of the other. Prayer, as you all know, is not withdrawal from the world, but deeper engagement with it always with the focus on God. I thank you for your presence here and for your attentiveness tonight.